This is where it happened. March the 11th, 1921. Flynn's house in Selton. The men billeted here. A safe house, they thought. It's only a week since the Shemore ambush. Sudden times. But they're welcome in Master Flynn's. These are the fields, the lake behind, the hills, ditches, trees, drains, a spring well. Who betrayed them? Different truths, different times. History is a broken story. The future, waiting in the shadows, always beyond us, always. They're gone now, the Protestant neighbours, the houses gone to dust. Isabella Latimer bundled and left for Belfast with her six children after her husband was shot, went back to her own people. Two of the girls returned once, years later, for a funeral, didn't want to have anything more to do with the place. It could be he was innocent, William James Latimer. Maybe he didn't say in the pub, on the street, in the RIC barracks, to Pentland, the doctor. My daughters saw strangers around Flynn's house, men in long coats. The girls had gone to McCullough's to borrow chairs or some such for his mother's wake. Whatever, however, word gets to the military, to District Inspector Gore Hickman and his men, an IRA squad in Flynn's house in Selton. Maybe it was Dr Pentland gave them away. When Latimer was on his knees on the street of his house in Dunaraw, to be shot by men from across the mountain because the locals wouldn't do it, he said, Don't blame me, blame Pentland. And the doctor fled to England for sure not long after, and was killed in an accident three years later outside his house in Gower Street in London. A lorry mounted the footpath, knocked him down. But was it an accident? Or the long hand of revenge clutching forward and back? History is a broken story. There was absolute silence in Mohol when the dead men and wounded were carried in on the crossley tenders to the barracks. Baby Kenny said you could hear a pin drop. No, she said, it wasn't true, the soldiers called out, fresh meat, when they drove the bodies in. But maybe she would say that. She had had her hair cut off in public, was tied to a German line telegraph pole in the town, had paint poured over her or was tarred and feathered. The details vary. Why? It was said she was having a liaison with the black and tan and was well warned but it might have been because the Kennys had a public house and went on serving drink to the soldiers despite the boycott. They always kept the best whisky in Mohol. Anyway, there was pitch silence in the town that evening. Silence can be a language of its own, its own silent protest. The tenders pull up on the road. Someone has tipped off the military. The house is silent. The sergeant walks down the path. A single gunshot rings out, zings over his head, over the road and hedge and the field where two men are digging the lee ground for planting. From the angle of the bullet, it can't have come from the house. Maybe it's a warning shot fired by a friendly RIC man to warn the volunteers. Maybe it's fired by one of the two men on lookout down the lane to McCullough's. Then the thing starts in earnest. The men running from the house firing, the soldiers firing the Lewis guns that are fixed here and here so that they'll get all of them. The IRA men are trapped, having to hope in hell. Michael Baxter, 21-year-old John Joe O'Reilly and Seamus Wrynn are shot dead. The other John Joe O'Reilly, he's 25, is shot as he's about to throw a hand grenade. His family aren't able to identify him later, but they know it's him. Two of the men fall, wounded, into that Mernon gripe. Joe Byrne gets a very hard death. 
He's mortally wounded, crying out for his mother. I don't want to die. Bernie Sweeney, hiding close by in the ditch, hears all. The soldiers come and bludgeon burn with the butts of their guns. That stops the crying. Sean Connolly dies from his injuries that night in Carrick Jail. Paddy Guckin, Jack Hunt, P. McDermott and Andy McPartland survive. Sweeney says the cold water in the ditch saved him. The icy temperature staunched the bleeding and he waited till nightfall, when the soldiers were long gone, to call for help. And help came. William Latimer is shot six times. One shot for each of the dead men he was said to have betrayed. Years before he stood up for a Catholic neighbour, wouldn't let the agents evict the man and his family. They're decent people, the rent will be paid. You'll not pass this gate, and it's not one arm of mine you'll have to break to get by, but the two of them. Mrs Latimer wasn't a blessed day gone when people moved in, stripped everything out of the place. They had no luck for it. You'd wonder what Dr Muldoon was doing that day, and Mary Kate Gologly, and Father Ryans. What did they hear about the massacre at Selton? What did they think or say? The future is waiting in the shadows. History is a broken story. It might as well be tomorrow. No trace of Latimer's or McCullough's houses. You'd never know they existed. It's a sight. The sun comes up. The sun goes down. The fields are as calm now as if nothing ever happened. We remember them all. God be good to them. The whole misfortune and question about Selton Hill has been bandied about for so many years, a hundred years now, so I'm not going to go into any great detail about what happened or why it happened or anything else, other than to say that over the years and all that was said and talked about and written about, sometimes they missed out on things like the courage of the men and the discipline of the men that were there that day. Um, when you think about the situation they were in and having been surprised by the Hertfordshire and Staffordshire Regiment, the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries, uh, when they looked out from the window of Paddy Flynn's house and from the gable of the house and saw what was up on the road facing them, uh, those were no raggle taggle army that was uh, in charge that day on the hill. Was, there were the Herefordshire and Staffordshire Regiment, crack soldiers from the British Army who had seen action in France and in the Dardanelles. And uh, those were young men who hadn't, we'd say, been confronted by anything like what happened that day. And yet with all the discipline and the courage they had uh, came through in them, whereby the easiest thing they could have done that morning, or evening I should say, was to throw up their hands and get a, a bit of a sheet or a flower bag and walk up the hill uh, waving the flag and throwing their guns out in front of them. But instead of that, they opted to take a chance and fight it out and die if they had to with the gun in their hand. Um, the British Army, as they knew then, and we all know now, never took surrender very serious anyway. So the chances are that if they had done that, they would have, they, 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 it would have ended up the same way. They'd have been killed and slaughtered in the same way as they were. On the way into Mohol, at some stage, they encountered Dr. Pentland, and he was supposed to have 
stopped them or let down the window and said to them, did you get them all? And he seemed somewhat disappointed when they told him they didn't think they did. So obviously he had perfect information as to how many of them were and where they were. He came in, they came into Mohol here and then went on, you know, gave a report to Gore Hickman, who was the, the, the DI in these parts, and went on to Carrick then and left them on the floor of the barracks in Carrick uh, for people, uh, the dying and the dead, Condy died that night, uh, for their people to come in the next day and identify the bodies or the rest over there. But Cooking went in uh, thinking that his son was dead, but he was glad to say that he wasn't, he had escaped and was on the run someplace close to home. Um, some of them that were able to be moved were brought in and arrested and, and, and imprisoned. And uh, young Joe Burden was brought home to Barnacoola the next day and buried here. And that's as much as you can say about them. They were brave men and their people too were brave people that had to put up with a lot. And indeed, many a year afterwards, those that depended on who was in charge in government, uh, they got a hard time enough, and particularly those who wanted to carry on the same struggle were, were hounded and rounded up and got no better treatment, indeed, in a lot of cases than they would have from the British. That's all. God mercy on them all, that's all I would say.